Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the next to last edition of Computer Science E34 uh, User Experience Engineering. And tonight we have Jalhavid Simka Cohen, who's going to be telling us what next, more of entrepreneurship. Without further ado. Hi, everybody, good evening. My name is Shalhavid Simcha Cohen, and I'm one of your dedicated TAs for this semester. In the name of all the TAs, it's been very inspiring to read all of your work. You have brilliant ideas, and we could see your hard work that you put into those projects. So we wish you the best of luck with your final presentation. I wanted to talk to you a little bit about the field that I come from. It's called instructional design. Instructional design is kind of a bombastic, grandiose word. And it basically means the design of instructions, right? It could be applied to the instructions of a video game, mostly applied to education, uh, but it could basically be also applied to applications, just like uh, we're doing. And this is kind of like the grand scheme of instructional design. It's analyzing, it's designing, developing, implementing, and then thinking again, prototyping, and so on. Um, and that's kind of the title of instructional design. I've also been working in a course on the platform of edX. edX is the um, equivalent for Coursera. edX is a platform of Harvard and MIT, where we take courses and turn them into online videos for you guys. I've been working specifically on the MIT X course called Who is Your Customer? The course has been taught by Professor Bill Allett in the, school of, uh, the, the business school of MIT. And Bill Allett is kind of a world guru of entrepreneurship. He wrote a book called um, Discipline Entrepreneurship and basically based the course on the book. And we turned the course into video. Based on the course, um, it was a very popular course. We had 54,000 students. So Harvard has an extension school. MIT does not. That's where we're here. Right. Didn't know that. Just, just, just. So MIT doesn't have a platform like that. And we kind of thought to take one of the courses of MITx and invite students from around the world to come to MIT for an accelerator of the course. So I had 500 applicants from the course apply to come to this five-day accelerator at MIT. And I interviewed about, well, we interviewed as a team, 200 people. And as a side effect, it kind of gave me a very good analysis of who is our customer for our course. Uh, and our customer was, uh, were entrepreneurs from around the world. Entrepreneurs are usually not very rich people, people with great ideas, uh, usually kind of refer to themselves as the black sheep, right? Why aren't you a doctor? Why aren't you a lawyer? Why do you want to start something new? And we basically, I was able to analyze and get a lot of ideas of what these entrepreneurs are after. And I want to share with you kind of, the, you know, some of the main questions that we got from the entrepreneurs. And I want to start with that concept that Professor Bill Allett taught a lot in this class. So we have to have the spirit of, the, of a pirate with the skills of a Navy SEAL. You're an entrepreneur, you're coming with a great idea, and you're coming in front of these big ships, right? You're kind of a pirate. You have something new and different. And those big ships, the big companies, they already have, they have funding, they have a clientele, they're very structured. And when you're coming to attack them, you can't attack them just like a pirate. You gotta attack them in a structure. You gotta be very disciplined about it, because if not, you'll just get lost. And so I wanna share with you some of the things from the course. Um, and I call this, where do we go from here? And before I even start, I wanna ask you a question. I'm gonna to present to you a picture, and I wanna ask you guys at home and here in class to look at the picture that I'm going to present. And for 20 seconds, or 15 seconds, because we're in a rush, Think about how, try to figure how many geometrical shapes you see in this picture. You ready? How many geometrical shapes you see in the picture in front of us? So, try to look at it, count whatever you can, what do you think is a geometrical shape? Okay, so for the people here in class, can you tell me how many geometrical, and you guys at home, how many shapes did you find in the picture? Just one, there was a black rectangle around it. Okay, so we have one answer, one. Another answer? Seven. Seven. So the truth is, I don't know how many shapes were in the picture, but who can tell me what time was on the clock? Or how many kids were on the bus? Or what color was the circle? So these are questions that 
we don't look at. If we don't ask the right questions, we won't notice them. And same thing with entrepreneurship and really everything in life. If you ask, you could be focused on one question and only see one picture. So I want to kind of take you a little bit into that mindset of, you know, what do we really focus on? In the world of entrepreneurship, you could come up with an idea and start realizing that your idea could be applied to so many fields. Let's say you come up with an idea of an online application that designs clothing for old women. And you start thinking and you're like, wait a second, this could also apply for little kids. And wait a second, it could apply for women and men. And maybe we could start with accessories too. And that's where a lot of entrepreneurs go ballistic. And that, that concept of focusing on this one client, and we call it, we call it market segmentation. Um, looking at all the possibilities that you have and trying to find what is, who is that market? What is that market that you want to focus on? Because believe me, I also started a venture and it's so easy to get lost in ideas. Um, the recommendation is to have a Google Doc or a document or even a book where you write down all of your ideas and keep it in the book. Um, so what is market segmentation? It's basically dividing the market and asking, asking those leading questions of really who is your customer and who is not. Here at User Experience, we try to help you really try and analyze by asking if you're trying to really get your customer and create a profile for your customer. Um, you want to find a group of people who have experienced a similar problem uh, and a group that is distinct, that is different from other groups. Um, you want to find a group that you're actually able to deliver a solution and it could be sustainable and a group that could pay a similar amount. These groups have to be kind of very similar. And I want to um, play a video. Whoops. Why, why a similar amount? What? Why, why does it matter that they can pay a similar amount? Is, is this... Well, it helps you focus on this one group, because if you want to eventually um, sell it to this group, you want to be able to sell it to a co like a cohesive, right. cohesive group when you market it. All right, all right, I see what yeah. you're Meet a team of MIT students who invented the new technology for harnessing energy from friction. This technology promises an unprecedented efficiency ratio, which makes the students very excited. They even created a self-powering skateboard to demonstrate what the technology can do. Start by brainstorming. Throw every idea at the vault, including the crazy ones. Don't worry about analyzing and especially criticizing ideas. At this point, keep your aperture wide open. Identify potential industries for your idea. In the case of the friction energy technology invented by our students, potential industries could be the automotive industry, sports, electronics, healthcare, energy, and architecture, to name a few. Subdivide each industry into markets and market segments. This gives specificity and structure to your process. Let's take the automotive industry as an example. This industry could be broken down into three key markets. The market for non-electric vehicles, hybrids and electric vehicles. And each of these markets contains market segments such as sedans, sports cars, SUVs, trucks, RVs and motorcycles. List the people who may benefit from your idea in each industry and ideally in each market segment. Focus first on end users, not customers. Your end user is a person who uses your product. Your customer pays for it. So far, our student entrepreneurs identified two main categories of end users. Those in the pre-production stage such as design engineers and assembly engineers, and those in the post-production stage, such as maintenance engineers and auto enthusiasts. Once you have identified the end users, describe the various tasks that they perform and how they would use your product. Your next task is to narrow the field. List the top 6 to 12 market segments that are most interesting. As with many things in life, your limiting factor is time. You should research and analyze prospective markets in depth, but you do not have unlimited time to consider all options. 
So 6 to 12 opportunities is more than enough. After that, your next step is primary market research. In other words, go and talk to some real people. Theory doesn't produce data, action does. Cool. So this is kind of the intro of market segmentation. I wanted to give you an example. It's really doing it at home. It's DIY. It's brainstorming. I deal with a group, with a team. I will get to that soon. Um, the next step after you start segmenting your market and the market that you want to choose first, we call it the beachhead market. The beachhead market is uh, this title, is this term is taken from, you know, if you want to come and conquer, conquer an island, you first want to take control, you want to take control of the beach first, and then you get into the rest of the market. The beach and market theory is really trying to figure out, you know, what is the best market to focus on after the market segmentation? You ask who is actually able to pay and who do you actually have access to? Which market can you actually invade? What are the competition? Which market do you have less competition? What makes you unique and different from other competitors? Can you actually deliver the entire product? Or can you deliver, if you deliver only part of the product, you might want to team up with others to deliver the entire product. How valuable are you to them? It's another term from business school. It's called value, value proposition. It's how valuable are you to them? Let's say you're making, you're making juice and this company only needs water, right? How important are you in their scale of what is the value that you're really giving to them and how valuable you are? You got to think of the timeline for your team. Entrepreneur, entrepreneurial ventures don't happen in a day or in a week. They usually take a few years. If you're working with a team, you got to be very realistic on how much time each one could put in. And you really want to find a market that you could dominate quickly. Again, these are very, very pointers. You could take the course for free online. And you could also buy the book Discipline Entrepreneurship to get more into detail. The bottom point of a beachhead market is really to, to find a market that you know, that it's easy to access, you know, from all these different aspects and eventually could lead you to the next markets. That it's a really beachhead that could actually lead you, once you really specialize and get very good at this one market, you'll, you'll get to the other markets. I want to show you part of a video that we presented in our course. And we interviewed an entrepreneur from MIT, AJ Perez. AJ invented a 3D printing machine. And AJ had a lot of different markets of you know, a 3D printing machine is something that could be marketed to the health industry. It could be for the game industry. And we followed AJ and tried to see um, really where could, he, where could he reach. And this is part of the interview with him, just to show you what, is, what are the real conflicts of an entrepreneur. And Bill Olet might show up also. A key measure for success of entrepreneurs, as we've seen at MIT, is the ability to select a market and then to be disciplined and deselect other markets. As much as everybody would love to attack everything at once and try and solve every problem in the world, it doesn't make any sense to do that. You have to focus on one specific market. As an entrepreneur, as someone trying to run their own business, it's really, really important that you not only select your beachhead market, but select it for strategic reasons. Meet your long-term vision. It's going to be difficult as a young, ambitious entrepreneur who sees a world of possibility to deselect some markets. Was that hard for you? Yeah, it's very psychologically taxing, in fact. When you're, you, you think there's an answer you want to hear, and you're working really hard to get that answer that you want, but then you know, the data is just showing you something completely contradictory to what you want to hear. And it's really difficult to accept that you are wrong, but you've got to just do it if you want to be successful. Think of it this way, and this is how I explain it to my students. You're out there and you're trying to catch a rabbit. Do you try to catch three rabbits at once? If you try to catch three at once, you'll end up catching no rabbits. Try to catch one rabbit at a time and you'll be much more successful. The way we go about this is, like I said, from a systems perspective, thinking about what we can and cannot feasibly accomplish. Part of what we did to segment this market down, looking at the, the education, the aerospace, the healthcare markets, is looking at what has the most layers of complexity. So the ones that have the most regulatory compliances are the ones that we didn't want to get involved in. For instance, if you're looking at creating anything in the medical device space, you have to go through FDA approval. That we immediately cross off the list because although that might be the money winner down the road, that's not what's going to get our foot in the door and get our brand any recognition. Same thing looking at aerospace. There's only a few companies in the aerospace industry, maybe a few dozen. 
in the world. It's really difficult to break into those markets. And when you can, you've just landed a really big client. But until that day, you have no clients. So we ax that one from the list as well. Well, by the rule of diselection, we've come to the realization that you've selected education as your market. Tell us about this decision. Yeah, so we've selected education because I see 3D printing as being a totally generational thing. And that's really where 3D printing is going to break into the mainstream of the world, is when we've trained the next generation of inventors and thinkers on how to actually think in the context of this new technology. Now you'll ask, what if AJ and NVBots chooses the wrong beachhead market? What you want to do is if it's going to fail, fail quickly, eliminate that option, and focus on the other ones that are higher potential. Action will produce real data, and that data will tell you whether your market, your beachhead market, will or will not be viable. Cool. So I just want to give you some time. As I'm going through, I want to present some entrepreneurs so you get some examples from people who are really doing it. AJ right now with his company EnvyBots are very successful in the education field. They're still in the education field. They did not enter the medical field or the entertainment, and they're doing very well. MIT is using them for courses. It's a small machine that could print 3D, um, and he's doing very well. And that was an example from the beginning of his process of hearing his experience. I want to talk to you a little bit about prototyping, because that is something that a lot of people get frustrated um, as, they, as they begin. And um, I want to share with you a story of Hyung Soo. Uh, Hyung Soo went to the Sloan School of Business at MIT and was good friends with uh, a blind person. Uh, and Hyung Soo saw how his friend um, would check the time on his watch. Hyung Soo says, well, a watch is something that you're supposed to watch. A blind person can't see his watch. And so going through the process with his best friend, trying to figure out how could he help him with his watch. Currently, or until now, people, with blind, uh, people who are blind had to either use a watch that you press and you hear the time. And that is very problematic because it could be very embarrassing. Um, Hyung Soo decided to focus on a market. Um, he decided that his demographic, uh, when focusing on, on blind people, are blind people, they're blind people who are born blind and blind people who develop this blindness in life. He chose people who are born, born blind and are in the normal world of, of the normal work word, world. And those people interact with normal people. And so they really care about, you know, about being different. And touching a watch that makes a sound is really embarrassing. It's embarrassing if you're in a meeting. It's embarrassing if you're on a date. And it just tells everyone, hey, I'm blind. Um, another question that he asked was, um, what, what is important for them? What is their motivation? Um, you see real trouble with your girlfriend. Yes. Yes. <laughs> um, and what Hyung Su saw is um, the other kind of watch that they could use is a watch that, has, um, that you could actually feel. So what he found is that blind people that were born blind, they develop a special sense of touch, a very, very good sense of touch. And they have also watches that they could open and feel the, um, the digits. The problem with that is often the digits move because you feel them. So he basically went over to follow blind people. He joined the Massachusetts Association for Blind People and went to groups of blind people. And he actually went to sit with them in their, um, in their meetings. Now, when you come and present a prototype to blind people, you can't present it like this to 50 people because they're blind. You had to go from one to one, knock on their doors, sit with them, and really see how does each one of his prototypes work for them. And it came with a great product. Uh, I'm going to show you only part of this video because it's pretty long. Um, but it's very inspiring. Let's see, is this six minute in? Yeah. Cool visually impaired, none of those images or description, written descriptions, none of them worked. So the only way we could, I could get feedback from them was to make a physical prototype like this and bring it to them one by one. You know, presenting this in front of a group, it doesn't work even. So I literally have to go you know, knock on the door you know, to meet with them individually and I mean, one meeting, it takes a, about at least a, uh, one hour. So I did um, 
I think I've met about close to 100 people who are visually impaired. And I've made a whole bunch of these so that you know, I can pass around you know, 10 of these at all at the same time. And so I collect their feedbacks. And even if I make a really slight improvements in these iterations, I have to make another whole set of physical prototypes. And again, do the whole thing over and over again, bringing the new iterations to them and say, hey, is this what you meant with your feedback? Is this the correct designs that you, you wanted? We went through more than uh, 50 iterations. This persistence, this patience, these iterations, this dedication to truly listening to your end users creates the foundation that you will need to achieve a breakthrough like Hyung Soo. The first thing that I found out from talking with uh, many different blind user groups is that they care a lot about you know, the, the designs and fashions and the style of the, the products they use or wear. And that's something that, I, the stereotype that I had towards them was they would not care about the design so much as long as it works well for them. I was totally wrong. I felt very ignorant after I found out. One of the first questions they asked in, in, in most of the user group meetings was about the size and the style, the design, even the colors. Because they're equally conscious of uh, about the styles of what they wear and what they use. And I, I think, if I think about it now, why would they not be you know, care about, caring about um, the designs or the styles of what they use or wear? You can see that every market, the approach has things that are that are revealed to you only after you really talk to your client, after you talk to a user, after you really get to know them, and you'll find surprising things. Um, Hyungsoo ended up designing something really beautiful. It's not in this picture, and I forgot to put it in. Uh, but you could look at the Eon Time piece. Um, it's spelled like this. It's a very beautiful, um, spelled over there. It's a very beautiful watch that today a lot of people use, um, even non-blind people. And think about it, you're in a meeting, and it's basically two circles that you could feel where's the first circle, where's the second circle. One is the hours, one is the minutes, and they're moved by magnets from behind. So you really can't change them. And you could even feel your hand in the middle of a meeting to know what time it is without looking at your watch. Uh, Hyung Su's wife doesn't let him wear his watch when they go on dates. Uh, snippet of marketing that I want to share with you. And it's another question. Does anyone know what is the best platform for marketing your product? Is it social media? Is it Facebook? Well, the answer is through email. According to, according to all the statistics, email is actually what gets you most connected. With Email is what actually makes the most business. So the most business gets out of, out of email. You know, I'll explain. It's emails once you get to know your customer and the customer knows you. It's not just the, those blast emails. Uh, but when you do blast an email, what is the best word to use on those blast emails? Free. Free? So the most popular word that actually sells is you. <laughs> if the word you, <laughs> if the word you is, is, one of the, is one of the first three words on your email, you know, how can you um, get a better education for your child? Right? People care about themselves. You want to talk to them about them. It's not about my product, listen to my product, see what I did. It's really about the other person. It's what can you help the other person. And it's also when do you send that email is another very important thing. If you want to send, uh, if you want to contact people who are, let's say, um, you know, young married couples, for example, who live in the city, you probably don't want to send them the email in the morning when they're in a rush to work. You want to send that email probably when they check their email, which is usually after dinner, after they put the kids to sleep, and they're just sitting and procrastinating on their phone. That's when you want that email to pop up and be special. And I said email, but it's email with authentic connection. It's making the real connection with your customer when they know that it's you and they could trust you. And then they're going to actually read your email. One of the stigmas about entrepreneurs is that entrepreneurs are lonely that we're this creature that you know, comes up with an idea. And we do it all on our own, and we either become a millionaire or we're not successful. Um, at MIT, 
there's a very big statement of every entrepreneurial venture needs to have a team. We call them the hackers, hustlers, and hipsters. Um, I'll start with the hipster. The hipster is the visionary, is the one with the, with the idea, with the excitement, um, with, with the vision to change. The hacker is the one who's brilliant with the, with, with the computer, with the geek, the one who's kind of more like the behind the scene. And the hustler, hustler is important in every team. Sometimes you have some of them, but usually in every team there's someone who's best at one. Hustler is the one talking about the money, talking about the business. And a lot of entrepreneurs get very discouraged when they realize that they're not all of them. But usually entrepreneurial ventures are made of a team, and every person in the team has a part. A lot of hipsters are not hustlers, and a lot of hustlers are not hackers. Um, entrepreneurial ventures are usually made of teams. Does anyone have any questions so far from the students? Yeah. Kind of like given these three personalities, what's ideal kind of ratio between hipsters, like hustlers, and hackers? Well, at MIT, we encourage people to be at least three people on a team. There are teams of two people. Um, I've been working with a professor here at Harvard, Talvin Shafa. He's kind of the outdated hipster. He's a professor that speaks about positive psychology, and he's been trying to advance his lectures and, and get to places because it was the most popular class. He didn't really reach a lot of people, and finally he coll collaborated with this man. He's like a hardcore hustler and maybe a little bit of a hacker. He's the one who organizes his business, who organizes his lectures, and it seems like they're doing much more together. So it's not usually one or other, um, but the encouragement is really to find the people who are better at what you're not that great at. I want to kind of share from, you know, really talking for, to a lot of entrepreneurs. Uh, the program of the boot camp started a year and a half ago. We just launched the second boot camp, and I'm in touch with entrepreneurs around the world, and I hear, you know, that person in France, what's going on, and they're trying to prototype, and he's making this, like, water system in his bathtub. And um, it's, very, it's a very hard process to start something new. Don't burn out. <laughs> it's easy to say, harder to do. Uh, one of the ways to really not burn out is, is having a team. Um, just sm some small tips from, from working with them. You know, what really helps is, is working with those baby steps. It's, it's trying to find, you know, one step to do at a time, creating a milestone. Um, like they say, write a business plan. But it's, it's, you know, in general, and just outlining, you know, this person actually tattooed it on her foot. Right? Try to take one step at a time and focus on one thing. When we focus on everything, we kind of lose everything. Eventually, it becomes something great. Also, going outside is helpful. Um, airing your mind. I just thought it's a cute slide. Um, I found the slide. It's really cute. There are many tips of how to focus, and each one of us finds what works for us. Um, but I have, I have this on my desktop of reminding me really what to do when I try to get something done, you know, shutting off things, um, having a pet nearby. Each one of us has what works for us, and really finding those ways to, um, to help us focus. Some people find the moments in the bathroom to just take a break and you know, think about what's going on or watch one of those entrepreneurship videos. These are for feedback. Um, another system is the meetup groups. Meetup groups are entrepreneurial locations where um, there are a lot of places, usually, I think within every big city now, they're like places like Venture Cafe here in, in Cambridge, uh, meetup groups for entrepreneurs a place where you find kind of a social network. And it could be really daunting to go to, um, to a networking event. But it's, it's less daunting if you realize that everyone there is like you. And you know, sometimes you go there and find the people who are going to help you. Uh, sometimes you just go there to like, open your mind and really find a structure. Um, the Roman Legion actually would structure itself um, in this like, special shape where they put the coward in the middle. Because that way, the coward is not able to run away. When you put yourself in a structured environment with a lot of people who are doing things, it kind of forces you to do th something too. So highly encourages finding a structure, um, either with a team or at least starting with a group that you could, could be com committed to and not doing it on your own. So really, try not to burn out. You know, taking a break is important and doing one step at a time. We're kind of heading now to the lo longest night of the year. Um, Hanukkah and Christmas and all those holidays happen exactly when the night is long and the days are short and people are really, we feel more lonely. Um, we're human, you know, we have our ups and downs. And around the longest night of the year, all the traditions, I guess 
I would call the traditions and religions of the world, I like to call them the accumulated wisdom of the world. Right? It seems like for a generation, people figured out that this is going to work. Structured coming together. Right? We have the holidays of coming together, bringing people together. Lighting candles is kind of symbolic. You know, there's a lot of darkness. We light the candles. Uh, I grew up Jewish, and we would light the menorah every night. We would wait till, according to the tradition, you have to wait till everyone gets home. You light the menorah together, and then you sit together for dinner. And this time could never leave me because, because that structured time happened every year, and we would always wait for everybody. And I know that at Christmas, everyone waits to, for you know you wait for everybody and you do things together. And having a structure is one of the wisest things uh, to continue in. Bill Allett called this course, called his book uh, Disciplined Entrepreneurship. And you know, there's, there's a lot of wisdom in finding a structure. So I wanted to wish everybody happy holidays of light. Um, and I wanted to encourage you, if you want to contact me, feel free. I, my name is pretty unique, so you'd find me with my name on LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, or my email, shalavid.gmail.com. And feel free to contact me with any questions. The course Entrepreneurship 101 that mit.edu um, is online. It's free to take, and you could take it on your own time. You could watch the lectures in the bathroom. I mean, they're very short lectures that are structured for you. Uh, but seriously, I think, I think I'm speaking for myself and for other TAs. Feel free to reach out to us. We're very happy to help. And thank you very much.